Hey, Stevie Taylor here. Welcome to episode 51 of the Gig Life Podcast. My guest today is Marina de Silva. Marina is a drummer, percussionist, singer, dancer, actor and radio host from Sydney. Growing up in Bondi to two Brazilian parents, Marina's father was a capoeira master and also a double bass player in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra. So there was always music and, and movement around. So she studied capoeira and music with her father but eventually found herself getting deep into dance. Today this combination of music and dance has her involved in projects like Junkyard Beats, Odoya, a radio show called Flywaves, he's a regular at the Monday Jam, and a daily study in Afro-Cuban and Brazilian music and culture. But there's so much more to Marina's story, and she shares a lot of that story with me here. We met up at a Eastern Suburbs library on a Tuesday night, but we got kicked out, so that was a bit of a bummer, as we had a lot more to talk about. So let's just call this part one for now. So ladies and gentlemen... Please sit back and enjoy while I introduce to you the fly, the vibrant, the funky Marina da Silva. Cheers. É isso aí, vamos lá jogar um jogo de angola. Eita, vamos lá. All right, I think we're rolling. Awesome. Marina De Silva. Hello. Hey, welcome to the Geek Life Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> and nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah, awesome. So um, what's this week? What's this week? What's been yeah, happening? What's been happening? Um, <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll start with today. Um, so today I, let's see, what was my day today? Oh, well, last night I was at the Monday Jam. Where, um, that's, that's a regular thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Monday Jam, um, it's an awesome music night that's been going on for I think around seven years in Sydney and I first saw them at Ginger's up on Oxford Street and they're over at the Soda Factory and I've ended up working on the door there for right. the past few months, which is awesome. Um, and, yeah, so those are my Monday nights. Right. I love it. Um, it's a great event, awesome people, awesome music. Um, and then this morning, today, I was over at Dom Kirk's place. Um, drummer, percussionist. Yeah, drummer, mm. percussionist, extraordinaire. Mm. Also a Baba Lao, which is like an Afro-Cuban uh, kind of priest in their spirituality. So I was over at his place for a cleanse and a reading mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, chatting about the drums and everything. So what so, does that involve? Uh, I'm speaking for somebody who has no idea. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, <clears throat> so The stuff that Dom Kirk is doing and um, the musical relevance, I think, also comes with the group Osaya Chur that he's formed recently. Uh, it's like an Afro-Cuban drumming, um, <clears throat> drumming, singing and dancing, traditional spiritual thing. Uh, so it's based around um, all of that and it comes with a whole... Uh, so the Afro-Cuban drumming and music that he's involved with c comes from uh, West Africa yeah. with that transatlantic slave trade that went to Brazil and Cuba. And um, so in Cuba it turned into its Afro-Cuban incarnation with all the... Um, so it comes with like a spirituality and the culture which has all its belief systems with nature-based deities and all the drums drum rhythms, songs and dances that relate to each one. So it's kind of a whole um, nature-based spirituality and belief system similar to, you know, many other uh, ones across many cultures, the dream time, 
the I Ching and, you know, all right. those other ones. So, uh, and Dom Kirk has been into it for a long time and he's done the whole initiation into um, becoming a Baba Lao, which is like a kind of, uh, you know, a, some sort of position, like a priesty type right. position. Right. So he had to, you know, wear white for a whole year, undergo many initiations and they do readings with shells and they have a whole divination system similar to um, the I Ching and other ones across many cultures. So along with all the amazing um, musical part of the culture, it has that that spirituality and that belief system. And so he does readings and cleanses and, you know, I've got to go take him back a silver bracelet that he's going to do a cleanse with that this particular deity is going to use to protect this aspect and yeah it's super interesting cool, we really yeah. went right into the deep yeah, end there yeah, straight yeah. away awesome <laughs> yeah it's all about yeah, we, yeah. Don't, we don't mess around here yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so that's yeah. super interesting yeah. um and uh so I got involved with that last year when we started doing um me and a couple other girls started doing uh some bata lessons with him which is the the drum that they use there yep and um he started uh, talking to us about everything that was involved with it. I can't even remember how exactly we started doing it with him, but, you know, obviously I'm, like, super drawn to the percussion, so somehow I ended up there, a couple other girls. And so he would teach us all the rhythms, mm. which are amazing because they're all those um, African polyrhythms and these little – it's, like, incredible. Those drums are amazing, mm. like – and he would explain to us. He's like, so, so it's got a large, larger diameter on one side than the other. Is that right? Yeah, yeah right. exactly. He's and, done and his it, research. <laughs> well, I've, 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 yeah, I've seen them. Right. They, yeah. They, they yeah. You sit, sit them across west. you. Yeah, right. yeah. And you've got the big side on your right hand, the little side on your left hand. Right. And there's three of them: big, medium, and little. And there's the whole. So the whole culture of them. You know, one's the mum, one's the little son. The son keeps the time. The mum gives the order. The one in the middle follows and responds to all the calls. Oh, wow. Yeah, this, it's super fascinating. And, you Makes know, he, me want to go get lessons. Well, you should hit yeah, him right. up, hit him up. Well, he's developing it, you know, it's growing. Right, like literally right. he was talking today about leading these more immersive um, kind of workshops for people, teaching them. He's making a lot of them mm. uh, at his place at the moment. Um, so we started learning that with him and... Well, you know, one of the things he said about the drums also, you know, he was like everything is in these rhythms, like everything. He's like there's disco, drum and bass, you know, like uh, everything. Um, So the rhythms were insane and, um, you know, you'd be playing them and you really kind of go in trance. Like I remember looking around and people would be like when you're playing it, people are like flying off somewhere. (sighs) That's cool. And we do, we were doing it on Sunday and it was like our Sunday church, like and you'd leave just like, cleansed and grounded and um so but the interesting thing um is that he was teaching us also the the spirituality and the stories that come with it and um it comes from like I said that transatlantic slave trade to Cuba and but the same another big part of what happened with other African people that um went on that kind of trip they ended up in Brazil as well and ended up with the Afro-Brazilian incarnation of the mix of those cultures and everything that he was telling us about I had grown up hearing from my dad Mm -hmm. because my dad is um he's kind of into this stuff as well he's a musician he's a capoeira master and so he raised me telling, like, talking to me about a lot of this stuff. Both my parents are Brazilian, so it was part of, I knew I had that kind of information Mm. in my um, ancestry. Mm. But when Dad had been telling me when I grow up, it's kind of like in one ear, out the other at some (laughs) point, you know. So coming back, like, I think it was last year or the year before that we started learning with Dom, and he was telling us all these things. And then as an adult, you know, with, you know, life as an adult like it was all coming in and I was like wow like okay like this is what yeah yeah, yeah. I was like this is what what he meant this is what he was talking about all along and um and yeah it was yeah that so that's it was super interesting and it really um yeah it's funny that we started with what did you do today I was over at Dom's and talking about this because that really sparked the like the kind of pinnacle of the integration of my personal like 
identity and path and cultural integration of my Australian and Brazilian sides in music, mm -hmm. through music and through the arts. Yeah. It's fascinating, eh? Yeah, yeah, it is, I, it is. Yeah. I think we, we probably do another podcast just on that. Yeah, 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 yeah for yeah. sure, yeah. for sure. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, it's awesome. really interesting. Okay, well, let's dive back into how how it all sort of started for you. Yeah. You, know, you're, you're, you were born in Australia. Yeah, yeah. so and I was you just born... said your mum and dad from Brazil. Yeah, exactly. So mum and dad are both from Brazil. Mum's from São Paulo, the city. Mm -hmm. And dad is from Manaus, which is the kind of the mouth of the Amazon, the entryway to the Amazon. And they met here in Sydney back in the 80s. Um, dad was a travelling musician. He had... Um, he, ca he came from, you know, more humble backgrounds in the Amazon area but his he chose music and so he went and he did his bachelor in music he joined the orchestra in Rio um, which is huge in Brazil like for for anyone to make anything of themselves you know right. like sometimes can be quite you know tough especially if you come from a more humble the more humble side of things so he really like um I probably I, I need to ask him more about his story really but yeah. um he, he kind of made it out there with his music and then he travelled to uh, Europe with playing in some jazz bands. I think he was a double bass player in the orchestra. And then he got to Australia and he was in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra for yeah. a few years, I think. Um, played in a band with Monica from Play School. Oh, really? Which was <laughs> awesome for me when I was little. I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, and then he started Capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial arts um, dance uh, thing. Um, he started, so he was the first person to do that here in Australia, which is pretty right. wild. Um, so what do you mean first person to do it, to start it here? Yeah, so right. back in the 80s there was, uh, they were in Bondi, mum and dad. Yep. Classic Brazilian move. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, when I, f sorry, when I first came to Australia, Bondi was New Zealand. That's no, it was, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where the Kiwis yeah. went, you know? Totally. I remember yeah. even when I was young and when I was growing up, yeah. there was like a few Brazilians, but there were a lot of Kiwis yeah. and Maori yeah. Islanders yeah. and stuff. And yeah. then Bondi got a bit more gentrified and, you know, yeah. it, you know, the, the population kind of changed. But, yeah, totally, that was the vibe yeah. back then. Yeah. Um, but so Dad was here and he was one of the Brazilians. And I think, you know, as a musician, he would have been like, you know, kind of linked to a wider community of Brazilians that existed at the time. And... I think the story was we actually went to SBS radio a few months ago um, for the Portuguese thing and they um, were asking Dad about this and I was there. So I think the story was that um, there was... They wanted... They asked him to put on a workshop... A, a couple, they knew that he did capoeira mm. and they asked him to put on a workshop at the uh, pavilion for a certain event or a festival or a weekend and he was like, yeah, sure, and he did that. Mm. And then um, they basically just continued, they asked him to continue and he kept um, teaching at the Bondi Pavilion and that was like the first capoeira right. in, in Sydney, in, right. in Australia. That's cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so he just continued doing that and then he's written a bunch of books about it now but uh, I remember in one of them it says like back then, so he was the first, he started the first capoeira school and now there are like however many capoeira schools and entities and bodies around Australia. Uh, are they all taken from your dads or people have just no, started so, their own Yeah, no, people, yep. people do their own things. Mm -hmm. So um, there's two types of capoeira, Angola and Hejonal. Right. One's more like traditional, um, slower traditional, more linked to the music and everything. And Hejonal, it's the more kind of acrobatic, physical okay. one. All right. So dad used to do Angola, which was the more traditional one. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so yeah, that ha that's uh, one of probably the most integral aspect of my journey in music and the arts, the fact that as soon as I could walk, Dad, he started doing kids' classes as well because, right. Right. you know, for me and for the friends and everyone around there. So I grew up doing capoeira, which for anyone who doesn't know, it has um, the movement part of it, so the martial arts dance part of it. Yep. It's a kind of like a non-contact um, martial arts dance. It has the percussive, mostly percussive instrument side of it. So there's a range of instruments that are used. And what are some of those? So the main one is the bidimbao. Yep. Which is um, 
Cabaça Arame Pedaço de Pau is the song in Portuguese, but it literally means cabaça is like the gourd yep. that um, sits against your stomach. Cabaça Arame means uh, wire, yep. so it's got a wire string. Yep. And then Pedaço de Pau is a piece of stick, so it's got your stick. So it's kind of like a yep. bow and arrow with the stick, the wire, right. the gourd, and then you play it with a little stick and another little stone pressing the wire oh, to, wow. uh, to change the pitch and the sound. Right. Yeah, and uh, also like a kashishi, which is a little shaker in the other hand, if you want. Oh, man. Yeah, So and it comes from, and so the relevance to what we were speaking about as well with mm. Dom Kirk and the Afro-Cuban mm. music stuff that he does is that um, capoeira was kind of one of the uh, things that came out of that situation in Brazil, of the Afro-Brazilian Afro situation in Brazil. Yep. So it's um it was the essentially like the slaves' way of practicing their fighting and keeping their that culture the same yep. culture that went to Cuba but in Brazil morphed in a different way. Right. So they have like the same 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 but different deities, same same but different songs, right. same same but different rhythms. So can I ask what a deity is? A deity is like a god or a god. Right. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Yeah. 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 Right. It's like a god or goddess figure. So. Yep. So the, the spirituality of the belief system is based around that. So, for example, you've got Yemaya, the goddess of the ocean, yep. and she represents, like, you know, fertility. Not fertility, that's the other one. Uh, she represents, like, she's, like, the mother and the carer and it's yep. water and it's blue and it's this and it's that and it's these aspects of existence or of um, humanity. Or right, and there's different music rhythms. Yeah, for, well, so there's each, different songs. Each, different songs, right. Yeah, okay. yeah, different songs and different right. rhythms that they would use to kind of in ceremony and um, also like, you know, now they're in like, you know, like they're pro it's prob there's probably some top 20 track that has aspects of that in it now. Right. Like, right. So it's like a spiritual, cultural, musical thing. Um, so, yeah, going back to the capoeira, um, capoeira comes from the slaves practicing, keeping their culture and practicing their moves and keeping fit and stuff. Um, and so it has to do with all the Afro-Cuban stuff as well in that it came from that transatlantic slave trade from West Africa. And, yeah, so the instruments, the bidimbao comes from Africa originally. The, the first one was from Africa. And, you know, I've YouTubed videos and you see them playing them in Africa and then in Brazil it's used in capoeira. Mm. And it's always slightly different. Obviously, they've got different um, natural elements to use in each place. And mm. so there's the berimbau and other ones, the pandeiro, which is like a kind of tambourine mm -hmm. type instruments that you, uh, that's kind of a hand percussion thing. And it's used a lot in samba music as mm. well. It's like the dunk shiki, dunk shiki, dunk shiki, dunk. Right. Uh, there's the agogo, which is like the cowbell. Yep. Um, <clears throat> the atabaki, which is kind of like the Brazilian conga, is kind of like this, um, there's this conversation around uh, is it, should it be used or should it not be used in capoeira? I don't know the full mm. history, but um, it was something to do with the atabaki. It is related too much to the spiritual part of it, so it shouldn't be used there or it's not enough and it shouldn't, right. something like that. So sometimes it's used, sometimes it isn't. People are on whatever side of the fence there of that. Okay, gotcha. Um, but, yeah, so I grew up doing that. So it's you've got the movement side of it, the percussion side of it, the playing the music mm. and all the songs um, that you sing. And there are a lot of those, like, kind of call and response mm. songs all about, you know, like the fisherman this and the family this and the game mm. this and life that and capoeira this and... Right. Um, so the stories, the call and response stories that are being told, do you, can you create them yourself? And you can. Right, okay. So yeah, you're, not, yeah, you're yeah. not having to sort of stay true to the, to the songs that already exist? Yeah, no, exactly. So right. there's like the classic, they're called La mm -hmm. They're like the... The songs, the cantos. There's the classic ones that have the classic stories, but even within even within them, you can kind of be like like ones like adeus adeus boa viagem. It's like bye, have a good trip. But even in that, you can be like adeus adeus like, and then you can improvise and be like I'm going away, see you later. Da, 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 da. Mm. Like even within the song, you can improvise, and you can also um, make your own. Right. Um, and I know that because I've done like a hand. Dad's done a handful of capoeira CDs throughout the year. Mm. 
the years. And uh, when I was uh, around a teenager, I remember we did one and his students at the time, he got some of them to write their own ones and they did theirs on the CD. Mm -hmm. And I've actually got it in my bag here, funnily enough, one of the latest books that my dad has written. Mm -hmm. um, it's all about capoeira and music and about the, uh, uh, yeah, the songs and uh, he talks a bit about the traditional ones and how you can write your own and everything about I haven't read the full book yet, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah, that's definitely so, where it all started because yeah. I started, you know, throughout the beginning of my life I was moving, drumming and singing okay. right. for a long time. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you... And Dad obviously always kind of taught me guitar from the beginning and mm -hmm. a bit of piano there, singing right. there and everything, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely. But then eventually you, you had a gut full of it. And exactly. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was around when I was like 13, 14. And like, dad, my dad is an amazing person, but as an orchestra trained musician and a capoeira master, you can only imagine, like, you know, like you gotta be you gotta be pretty hectic to be doing those things. And I think as like a young girl, I was you know, I just, yeah, I got a gutful essentially and I remember just leaving when, a capoeira class when I was like 13 one time yeah. or something and I was like, Mom, I don't want to do capoeira anymore. I just want to do dancing instead. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, because yeah. I was doing dancing, you know, as well at the time at school and stuff and um, so she was like, yeah, yeah, sure, you know. And I think it's like a classic story, you know, like kids with parent musicians, like, you know, it happens. And mm. so I was like, okay, enough of that. Not going to do that. Going to going to focus on dancing instead. So I went and, you know, focused deep on the dancing and I was doing, you know, like 15 hours a week, jazz, tap, ballet, hip hop, Steadford's competitions and right, stuff. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah, a lot, a lot. I um, was super into the dancing and I was like 20 centimetres taller than um, most kids my age until like year nine because I just had a growth spurt super early on right. for whatever reason, which meant that in dancing I was always placed in the older groups Okay. Um, because I looked too out of place with the younger ones. But um, it's great because it meant that with the, you know, with growing up doing capoeira and stuff as well, like I, you know, I got some good, some good solid dance training uh, throughout my younger years. So I focused on the dancing and I also dropped um, any music because um, from my memory and my current understanding anyway, I think it was just too hectic for me learning music with my dad. Like I kind okay. of, he has a really like strong way of speaking. And I remember like going to like sing and being like, ah, like, oh no, like mm. it's wrong. Like, ah. So it was the thing that was like, you know, lost in translation uh, because I know that he's, you know, always just wanted to encourage and support the best out of me, but mm -hmm. the tra didn't translate. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got scared off doing music and got super creatively blocked for many years. Mm. And dancing, I was obviously still creative and stuff, but for a long time, even though I was doing a lot of dancing, I only realised later that it was very much in a, like, cool, I can do this and I can do it well and I'm getting it right, so I'm going to, you know, like, keep doing it well and right. And only later, like, later on in my life did I start engaging with dance in a way that I was like, okay, this is, I enjoy it and I can express with it mm. and it's this and it's that. Mm. Um, so yeah, stopped doing the music, went deep into the dancing and then towards the end of, uh, high school, I was friends with heaps of musicians. Like by year 11, 12, I was made friends with all these AIM kids right. and, you know, I'd skip school in year 12 and go to my friend's place where he had like a music studio and just hang out there all day, just watching everyone. Right. Just like, watching it. It's funny because now... Taking it all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now mm -hmm. my friends from that time, now that I'm doing, you know, a bunch of stuff with music and everything, now they're like, oh, like we never knew you were even like did anything with music or whatever. But, you know, I was there and like loving it and like was like so drawn to being around the music and stuff but blocked to kind of like didn't... Was like, okay, that's their, that's their game. They can do it. Were you purposely blocking yourself? I didn't really, I've only like realised this now, like in, like observing in retrospect. But at the time I just knew, like I was just naturally drawn to it. Yeah. But it was literally like, okay, they go to AIM, they study music. Like I'd right. love to jam with them. I didn't even acknowledge that thought, but I, inside right. I would have loved to, but right. I was like, nah, like that's their, 
that's their musician's world, you know, okay. like I'm not allowed. Like, but I did, um, I did, I love drumming so much that I did at various point get uh, little kit lessons with some of the guys. Like at some point later in year 12, I was like, oh, like I really want to learn the kit. And my friend was like, yeah, like buy me a pack of diaries and I'll give you a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great swap at the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that like, you know, I dabbled in it a little bit then. Um, but it was kind of, you know, like always, you know, like, oh, that's their thing and this, is, you know, like I'm not. But it was awesome like being surrounded by those um, musicians at that time because mm. it was a little bit different to what I'm naturally into. Like they were kind of like stoner rock boys and listening right. to like Radiohead and mm -hmm. all that and mm -hmm. um, a really good friend and then boyfriend at the time uh, from that time he was like a super, super gifted musician and mm. so I got you know, deep into like the classical music, mm -hmm. all the like, all this wild stuff. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, and so that was cool. And then after high school I went travelling in South America mm -hmm. for the better part of the two years after high school because I think I was listening to this kind of thing inside of me that was that one, but I wasn't really acknowledging it that I just had kind of had this sense of like I want to go back to South America and like, figure out what the hell my this part of me is, like the Brazil part, yeah, because cool. growing up, like, here I had all these things that made me super weird, like the, you know, the capoeira, like this even speaking. Who, who said you were super weird, though? Were people saying you were weird? Um, may, um, yeah, I do remember one time, like definitely once a, a boy in, in primary school was like, you're weird. With the capoeira, oh. so I was like, but it was more like a sense of, it was more just like a sense of no, like knowing that that stuff was different and, okay. um, and I don't know, like, and also just like growing up, you want to fit in, like, you know, you want to fit in and you want to, yeah. you know, like you think it's natural. So it was always a little bit of a funny thing. And I remember, you know, like even I had a bunch of friends whose parents were Brazilians and who had the Latino parents. And it was always like that embarrassing thing of like our loud Latin parents and like how <laughs> embarrassing and da, 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 da. Um, but then, so that was here. Yeah. And, but it was also like an interesting point, you know, always it was like, it wasn't just that, like there was also the other side of like, you know, like, cool. Like I have this Brazilian heritage that's like, you know, definitely cool as well. But then I'd go to Brazil when I was growing up and then there I was so Australian like to them, I was like super Australian. So right. the identity and cultural mm. piece, after high school, I went to Brazil and kind of um, traveled there for a long time, came back, worked a bunch, went back and traveled again, studied mm. Spanish and um, did, all, did all that. And now I'm going, in a week's time, I'm going back to Brazil again, but purely to train in drumming and dancing and singing and all of that, oh, wow. which I think is probably what inside I probably wanted to do maybe like with that first trip all along. But anyway, like it was a definitely like me being like, okay, like what are my roots? Like who am I? Like how does all this fit in? Mm. And, um, and you know, like most of the time I was just partying and, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, like, but, you know, awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all part of it. But, um, yeah, then I came back and I went to uni and, no, when I came back from the second trip, mum was like, Marina, if I ask anything of you, it's that you go to uni, choose something at uni, please. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, whatever. Like, <laughs> can do, mum. Like, sure thing. Because so I went to a selective school and was in the OC and stuff. Like, I think mum had, like, high academic um, hopes on me and, right. you know, but so I was like, yeah. And I had no idea, you know, I was just travelling in South America and I was like, yeah, yeah, sounds good. And, like, I'll go to uni. Um, and so I chose to do a Bachelor of Health Science in Chinese Medicine because it was the most holistic. I was always, from year nine, I started getting interested in nutrition and well-being and human biology and all of that. So it was the one that had the most to do with what I, want, with what I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Didn't think of what it was going to class, like, uh, qualify me to work in yep. too in depth, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's interesting how it ties in because I learned about the I Ching there, which is like the Chinese spiritual divination system and everything that ties in, you know, with all this Afro-Cuba and Ifa mm -hmm. stuff, the capoeira stuff, and, mm -hmm. you know, it all, it all relates. Um, so I went to uni and then uh, while I was at uni, I went back to dancing again 
and it was glorious and wonderful and I was actually, I used to smoke cigarettes and um, the day that I was like I'm quitting cigarettes, I looked up dance classes and there was one starting in 20 minutes and right. and I went straight to that dance class and it was um, Jamaican Dance Hall at Dance Central and I never stopped since. I was like, this awesome. is the best. Like, mm. Yeah, it was the best swap I've probably ever done, cigarettes for dancing at that point yeah. in my 20s. <laughs> um, but then that took off. So, like, within a few months they were like, you know, can you do this gig? Can you t- teach this class? Can you do this? Awesome. And so that started, like, essentially, like, you know, my little career or thingy in dance, mm. which was amazing. Um, and and eventually as well I was, like, draw, you know, I was drawn back to the music as I always was and mm-hmm. I had always dipped in and out of drumming classes here mm-hmm. and there and um, I went to actually this festival, like a kind of Bushdorf type festival called Yemaya um, and a friend of mine, Dean Ginsberg, was curating the opening ceremony mm-hmm. and he got me along as a dancer mm-hmm. to do dancing in it and um, the Rhythm Hut guys, uh, Rendra from the Rhythm Hut was involved, so the Rhythm Hut is up in Gosford and you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of awesome musicians were involved, uh, like Dom Diaz and I don't know, can't, can't remember now off the top of my head, but awesome musicians, David Goldberg, who's a drummer as well. And so I went as a dancer and at the festival, our campsite was just full of drums from the rhythm heart. And, you know, I was just, we were just drumming the whole time. And that, like, the love that I have for percussion and drumming was, like, super reignited. And after um, after the festival, we were at Marrickville Markets and I was talking to David, my friend who's the drummer, and I was like, David, like, I need to, like, get back to learning drumming. Like, but, like, what, what do you reckon I should do? Like, congas, drum kit, this, that, like, what do you reckon? Yeah. And he was like, talk to that guy over there. And two metres away was Oded Pryor, the founder of Junkyard Beats. Um, and he was like, so I went to talk to him and I was like, hey, like my friend told me to come talk to you. He said you're doing some classes or something. He was like, yeah, yeah, Wednesdays in Marrickville, body percussion class. I was like, yeah, cool, sounds awesome. So I went and um, he was teaching body percussion, which is, you know, exactly what it sounds like. It's body percussion. Mm. Uh, he was from Israel originally. His mm. wife's Australian, Israeli. And I did the class and I lost my shizzle. I was like, this is the best thing ever. I'm (laughs) dancing and I'm making beats. And I I was just like, oh my God, like what, like this is amazing. And then I went to the next class next week and I was literally just like having such an amazing time. After the second class, he pulls me aside and he was like, so I see you're into it and like, and I've always had a facility picking up rhythms probably because I, you know, I've yep. been doing it since so young. And he was like, you know, like, are you working with any other groups? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, well, you know, like I'm dancing and I do this and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, uh, do you want to join? He's like, we've got a group that performs. Do you want to join? I was like, yep, a hundred percent. Yep. <laughs> Take me please. <laughs> so that's how I joined Junkyard Beats. So when was that? When did that start? That was like now it's crazy, like three, right? Maybe three over three years ago. Yeah, um, it still feels so relatively new, mm. um, but yeah, it was probably like three years ago. Um, so I joined Junkyard Beats, which is amazing, and like and like one of the most special projects to me. Um, so it's kind of like, a, you know, if you know Stomp from New York, it's like the, it's the closest reference that a lot of people know and can mm-hmm. recognise. It's uh, junk percussion and body percussion. Right, like tap dogs. Yeah. Sort of, but without the tap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, every, but everything else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it mixes like junk percussion. So yeah. we use like buckets, there's bucket drumming. Um, what else do we use? Uh, bucket drumming, broomsticks, um, all sorts of other things and body percussion as well mixed with dance, theatrics, comedy and stuff. And so we do shows and a lot of um, workshops as well with yep. kids mainly around, at schools. You go into schools and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah a lot nice. of the kids, which is amazing because I've always worked, like at uni I was always working with kids. I used to do youth work. Right. Love working with kids. And it's just the most amazing thing for kids because the whole message is like, you know, there's music everywhere. You can make music with anything that you mm. have and mm. look after the planet. And yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Um, so yes, yeah, so I started doing junkyard beats at that point. 
uh, which was amazing because it gave me, you know, for it gave me this really solid um, base to develop percussion because we literally are using any and every kind of instrument to make rhythms on. And because I joined like a year after he had started it here, it was still very, um, very fresh. And we've really like, you know, like I've been like blessed to be a part of building, you know, the group and developing like new things with them. And um, so it's just been the most amazing, like rhythmical project and experience. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the um, like creating the material. Mm. So how, how does a session go down? Do you just like rock up to wherever you're meeting and yeah. someone grabs something and just starts playing? Yeah, kind of pretty much. Well, Oded, who runs it, never stops playing okay. anything. He literally, when we've gone on like tours and we've had like hotel rooms where the shower, like you can hear him in the shower, he's still <laughs> tapping. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's amazing. Um, but so we did, we developed a new show recently. So we've had like our, you know, corporate packages and festival shows with a combination. Okay. So each routine is like you've got your bucket routine your broomstick routine, your body percussion, your this, whatever. But we recently created with um, a creative director um, a new show, like a 45-minute length theatre piece um, with four characters Mm -hmm. um, that goes and they're in this kind of box world, exploring Mm -hmm. rhythms in it. So that was a really interesting experience because we had um, Nigel Turner-Carroll, an amazing creative director who I think has worked with Tap Dogs and such as well. And we were creating this whole new show. So the core of that process was like two, almost two weeks um, in the TAFE music rooms at Ultimo from like nine to five creating this new show, which was a wild experience. Mm. (laughs) So we kind of had like a structure of the story that we were doing in, but so one, you know, like there would be a part where we're there and we're like, okay, like we've got the intro. So we're going to be doing boxes and the boxes are going to do this and we're going to do these. We're going to have rhythms with them here, pass them along here. And then that's going to, I don't know, it's hard to explain what the process was because it was, you know, so like, like nothing else, you know, I've done before, like, Mm. Every part of it was different and I can't say it was n- entirely not stressful yeah, because course, we yeah. were at each other's throats. Right, right. <laughs> For a lot of it. God yeah. bless Nigel Turner Carroll, the director, who kind of kept things um, running. So um, why, why were you at each other? Uh, because like we're all... Cre- creative differences and things like yeah, this? Yeah, no, we're, we're all, like, at this point we're all kind of, you know, like family, like we're all very yeah, close. Okay. And it was the four, like, he, you know, it's, it's Oded, the guy who started it, and three of us that, um, you know, he chose to do this show. Okay. Um, so the people with, you know, the most potent, like kind of potential to be able to create it. I've got to. Um, as well. Um, because, so it was me, Brayden, uh, this boy who's a dancer and he's a super, inc- like an incredible choreographer mm-hmm. and has amazing visions um, but is like, you know, diplomatically very held back, which is good. Then there's Leslie who um, <laughs> was in the group from the beginning as well and is just like uh, off his rocker. Like he's studying <laughs> math. He studies maths and he's like a, he's a little creative genius and a half and um, amazingly intelligent, creative guy. Um, and then there's me who, you know, so they've got all those aspects to put into the show and then there was me and I can only imagine that, you know, Oded got me there because, you know, he knows how much passion and energy I have for this stuff. And, you know, like, and, you know, I really had the energy and the passion and the creativity for it, but I wasn't so diplomatic <laughs> as Brayden. And I've realised that Brazilians and Israelis have similar personalities in a way and not in a way. And um, it was good. Like, it's a healthy, you know, everyone loves each other, but, you know, there's like I had to learn. It's, it was a really interesting process of learning how to work with people because, yep. you know, I had to learn when to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but it was amazing to be able to put, cre- you know, like create like my creativity into that along with, yep. you know, working with everyone else and creating all together like this amazing, um, this awesome, really fun show that we 
that we have now that uh, we took to Woodford. We did it at Woodford and, you know, we've travelled a few places with it. And um, the reception that we got, uh, like particularly at Woodford, where we had at least one show a day, um, was amazing after coming out of the whole process of it. Because, you know, when you're in a process of something, you kind of, you lose the side of it from the outside. Mm -hmm. So to then get feedback from people on the outside, it reminded us that, like, we've got this whole show that's based on rhythms. We're all talking in rhythms, gibberish rhythm. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no, like, like, it's all in gibberish, all in rhythms, telling the story. And, you know, all these characters are going through all these things in this world. And there's just, like, rhythms being made throughout all of it with all these different instruments. Yeah. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that's cool. super, super, super So cool. what's your character? So my character is called um, Rakakaka. <laughs> um, there's Hu, he's the boss um, Skibbity bee, skibbity boo Which uh, was Brayden And now there's been some cast changes Brayden's on the trip It's now Georgia, this incredible uh, dancer um, And then Flabber the Book He's the, he's the kind of baby <laughs> character So my character's kind of like She's actually turned into like this like DJ character And she's like the kind of exotic Like loud Like um, character but also has like you know like a soft touch with the little baby flabber to book who gets born into this box world like teaches him some rhythms and um and such uh so yeah it's I hope I hope with this show we get to do more public shows because yeah, we've done a lot yeah. of like corporate stuff festivals and stuff but you know so many of my friends in Sydney haven't even seen any junkyard beat stuff and right. it's so cool it's so awesome like it really in the world, what I like, what I've found that I've ended up doing in the world of music and the arts and stuff, because um, there's so many avenues, especially there's so many avenues, right? But um, for me, at least, Junkyard Beats is one of the projects that I do that aligns so much with so many of my kind of core values yeah, and intentions. Yeah, yeah. So it's amazing to be able to, you know, like work with music and the arts and uh, and all that in in that capacity, like with something like that, that has such a nice message as well. That's yeah. really cool. Mm. Living the dream. Yeah, hey, yeah, a it? dream, a yeah. dream. Yeah, we're yeah. all in a dream, you know. Yeah, that, that's it, that's it. Um, it doesn't come without its struggles and its hard work, you know, it's all the yin and yang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. Now, um, your other project, now, excuse me if I don't pronounce it properly. Give it a try. Odoya. Perfect! Yeah! Wow! Hey. That's rare. Hey. Hey. Amazing. Even yeah. the Latinos sometimes pronounce it oh, wrong. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 So the yeah, Odoya is another project um, that I'm currently involved in. And mm -hmm. so Odoya, the word, it's like a salutation or amen to Yemaya, the goddess of the ocean. Okay. Um, who's like the goddess of creation, um, which is super interesting because, you know, amongst all these themes, like, you know, I started getting into the drums of the Yemaya festival and mm -hmm. Um, Dom Kirk, who interacts with that, those beliefs and stuff, he, he's guessing, until I do the proper ceremony, you can't know, but he's guessing that I'm a daughter of Yemaya, so everyone's born under a certain okay. deity or sign. Right. Um, uh, so Yemaya, wait, which part of Yemaya were we talking about? Oh, yeah, Odoya. So Odoya is the word for like amen to Yemaya, like a, you know, a salutation to Yemaya. And Odoya is a project that um, uh, Maite Inae, uh, my friend and also um, an artist and singer, we started together. Um, so let's see, where do I start with this one? So um, so my, you know, we've gone through a bit of my story. My there has, you know, a very parallel story in many ways. Um, so my dad was the first person to do capoeira in Australia. Her mum was the first capoeira master, first woman capoeira master in Australia. Oh, so wow. she was, yeah, so she was four years younger than me and grew up. So we both grew up doing capoeira with our parents and, you know, her mum also did. Did you know each other at the time? Yeah, we uh, did. Okay. Yep. We did. So the community, the Brazilian community was much smaller then, so everyone knew each other. Yeah. And, you know, we even did, you know, like we interacted a lot. Um, but she was four years younger than me, so we didn't hang out, like later on kind of thing. We didn't really hang out much. She had her younger Brazilian kids, friends, and, you mm -hmm. know, the I had the older ones a little bit. Um, but very parallel stories. And then, you know, a few years ago, um, at the same time that I uh, dropped the health science at uni mm -hmm. and decided to, because I had a point where I actually dropped uni and I decided to, instead of keeping the arts stuff, the music and the dance and everything on the side, I decided to properly pursue it. 
um, instead of just keeping it on the side as a so hobby and stuff. So, well, so, so we'll go back to the the Odoya thing. D- that decision, that decision to make. Yeah. Was it like a a moment you had, or was it something that kind of built up? Um, it's a whole story in itself. Oh, okay. So, yeah. um, you know, so like I said, I always had the, you know, the the urges within me to do the music stuff and everything, which I kind of, for various reasons, blocked for many for many reasons and a lot of time. And then towards the end of uni, when I had one year part time to go of this five year degree, um. I essentially had like a a big like life breakdown, like a big like yeah. So um, we'll we'll go over it quickly, not to get too real on sure. the podcast. That's but yep. <laughs> so yeah, no, I had like it was a really um, a really like serious um, big like kind of mental, emotional, physical breakdown for various reasons in my in my life, and I got really unwell, and then and. It came to roughly tell the story. I was having like a bit of a funky time in Sydney trying to like figure out what I was doing. Totally miserable at uni because Mm. uni's, you know, tough at the best of times, especially when you're like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I had like, you know, the music and the, I think I had already started performing with my dad because I went back to him for singing and guitar lessons and next month he was like, I got us gigs and (laughs) we started playing Brazilian music with the band. But I was kind of having one of those moments where I was like, what am I doing? Like this uni stuff. I was always super drawn to like the health and the healing. But, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're studying that stuff, it's all you're studying like illness and disease. So I was getting like super depresso, like (sighs) looking at all that stuff and um, trying to figure out what I was doing. And I was definitely not like in alignment with, you know, like with myself and what I should have been doing. And I decided to take myself off to Thailand for a month before I went back to uni to do some yoga and, and, you know, I wanted to do this yoga course and I was like, you know, I'll sort myself out and then I'll get back to Sydney mm-hmm. and it'll all be sweet. Mm-hmm. Went to Thailand, developed um, crippling insomnia and just to gloss over the story, like it was real bad, like the worst. And so I came back and I had to see a bunch of doctors and they were like, how did you survive that? Like mm. how are you not in a psychosis? Yeah. It affected me really badly. Like it took a long time to recover physically and um, mentally, but, um, when I came back, I had to, you know, first get the sleep back on track and then begin to start looking at trying to heal my bot, like my body. And also at the same time, like still figure out what the fuck I was doing, like in the world, like in my life, which I couldn't because I couldn't think and I couldn't move. Mm -hmm. I was like vegetative. Like I literally couldn't think, couldn't move. And Yeah, and thank God I got out, you know, thank God I made it out. Um, But, you know, I could talk about that for a long time. But, you know, fast forward, I started getting better and um, one of the first, like I didn't experience anything good for a while. I didn't know the human condition could be that terrifyingly awful. But, you know, I muscled my way through it. I think having done two Vipassanas in the past, the 10-day meditation thing, really helped me because if I hadn't have been able to like at some point sit back and kind of just chill with whatever was going on and, Mm. you know, like observe it and not react, you know, and try and move on uh, because it was really that awful. But as soon as something, as soon as I started experiencing anything good, I felt like I thought that my life was over. You know, I was like, I looked at the situation that I was in and all I could understand was that everything I had done in my life had led up to that moment and it was all over. Like I was like fucked. Like it was, Mm. you know, I couldn't think, couldn't move, blah, blah, blah. Like it was really like without going into the awfulness, it was really, really, really awful. But then as soon as I recovered a little bit, um, you know, I went back to living at mum's, like dear little mumsies, you know, Mm. and I had a couple of really good, amazing friends. I didn't like tell anyone like Mm -hmm. anything that was going on, but I had a couple of close friends that kind of knew and got involved at some point. And, um, you know, I even moved, I even managed at some point to move back out to my friend Miko's place in Bondi. And one of the first good things that I started experiencing, like the first time, like was music Mm. again. Um, and to experience something good, again, was just like a beacon of light through that because all it had been for so, for like what felt like so long was just 
like putting one foot in front of the other, like second by second, just trying to survive through this like, like awfulness. And so as soon as anything good started happening, I was like, because I had to rely on all my reserves and all my strengths to even to like, you know, lift myself out of bed every morning for so long. Mm. I still had all that momentum and all that energy. And so as soon as anything started, good started happening, I was just racing for it. And also then have being given like feeling like I had a second chance at life. I was like, okay, well, what, you know, like I'm going to, I'm going to do what I feel like I need to or want to do because you know, like I've just lost like a whole six months of my life. Um, so, you know, like I can't remember exactly how it started, but I think I, oh, miraculously I stayed a member of Junkyard Beats through this. Okay. And I, you know, I talked to them a little bit about it afterwards and they were like, oh, that's why you were being so weird. But I remember, go, I don't know how, but I would go into Junkyard Beats rehearsal when I could bet, like, with the power of my mind to be walking there and, you know, like, Odette would be like, jump, like, you're meant to jump, like, why are you jumping? I'd be like, I'm trying. Like, somehow, like, stayed active there, was playing music with my dad at the time. My dad obviously knew what was going on, so he kind of, like, helped me through that or whatever. But as soon as I started getting the energy and the reserves to, like, put myself into anything, I was like, 2,000%, go, go, go. So... And I knew then, I was like, if I'm going to do anything, like, I, you know, it's going to be the drumming, it's going to be dancing. I remember the first time I went back to a dance class again, I was like, oh, my God, like, this is life, this awesome. is living. Awesome. <laughs> and luckily, because I had that foundation, you know, kind of I was already working in it and doing everything, like, you know, like it had the, I had the foundation for things to start rolling. So I really went for it and, you know, things really, like, took off in a really beautiful way, like Junkyard Beats took off and was doing that and all these other projects that have come about, mm. you know, came about and I kept going, you know, I kept going with all of that. So that's where that decision came from. I was like, I'm not going back to uni. I'm doing this. And if I'm going to do it, you know, like I'm doing it. Yeah. Fuck, that was a good answer. Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't think that I was going to go into that story because I really, like, I haven't spoken to barely anyone. Right. Yeah, really about that story since then. Only, like, a handful of people really know even this, like, that's only the surface really of it, you know, anyway. Because this podcast goes to millions. So, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> They're all going to know. No. Well, you know, but that's the story and it's yeah, kind of, it's awesome. relieving to tell the story okay, because, awesome. you know, Good. like, a lot of people, like, in the music and the arts, a lot of what... I'd been doing it's like it's on Instagram, you know, like so people see it on Instagram, blah blah blah. Sure. But it's a very it's a very small fraction of the story. And you know, I feel like to an extent I've been kind of living a double I was living a double life for a while, like still okay. really struggling, you know, with my health and everything, but still muscling my way and trying to be like I was so grateful for any like I would see like a leaf on the floor and I'd be like, oh my God, like life, like we're living, like this is amazing. That's great. And everything like, you know, so it was interesting, you know, then coming into contact with like, you know, the jaded musicians of <laughs> of Sydney and everything because I'd just be like, oh my God, like what Get are you talking here, about? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> like anything, like the, like the music <laughs> was just so amazing, so amazing and... I was just so grateful for it and so great because when you put energy into things like when energy, they take off and, you know, things happen. Yeah. And I was putting so much energy into things that amaze, really amazing things have happened, things that I wouldn't even have dreamed of really, but that's been happening, you know, for a long time. It was happening at the same time as a lot of struggles and stuff. So, you know, like it's kind of relieving to, you know, to finally get to a point where I can – almost, you know, objectively be like, that happened and now we're here yeah. and, you know, onwards and clarity with the story. Because, you know, it had a, it had effects as well that I couldn't explain to people. Like, you know, like I was like, you know, late all the time for everything. And I think I'm, I'm usually, I'm a Brazilian, so, you know, it's natural. But, you know, a lot of it was to do with I still had so much, you know, like physical and mental uh, struggles that I couldn't, I didn't have the capacity to manage my life the way that I was living it mm. and I, you know, wasn't asking for the help that I needed as well. So, you know, it had all these repercussions and people like, like, you know, a dad from Junk Abyss, he was like, what's going on? Like, he was like, why, mm. why can't you jump? Like, why are you doing this? So, 
you know, like I feel like at some point I'm going to have to like, you know, do the rounds and be like, yo, like that happened. Sorry about, you know, sorry about like, you know, whatever. Don't have this to do the that. rounds now. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Like, exactly. Just listen to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is why I was a weirdo yeah, yeah, back no. then. <laughs> no, thanks for sharing that. That's, yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But, um, but it really, and I never, I remember the day that I was like, I could finally say I'm grateful for that experience because mm-hmm. of the way that it springboarded, mm. you know, like the, 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 the energy and the life and the motivation and the passion to be doing a lot of what I'm doing now. And it springboarded, you know, these, this journey as well that, you know, I'll be, and the lighthouse at the end of the tunnel of that whole story from two years, the t- last two years till now is this trip that I've got coming up mm. um, in Brazil where I'm going to, you know, with the intention to just go into like turbo training mode, like, you know, learn, integrate the music and the culture, train all the things that, you know, that I always want to do. Because for, you know, I've been doing a lot of stuff here in Sydney as well, amazing stuff. Mm. But, you know, I've had, even though I grew up, you know, with a lot of this stuff, I've had, you know, a little part of me that's been like, oh, like, you know, I probably needed to do some extra training or like I want to, to be able to do my best in what I'm doing, you know, like I want to, I want to train and I want to, you know, I want to have the percussion chops. I, there's a dance course that I'm going to do that I really want to do as well. I want to learn all the traditional songs and stuff because, you know, although yeah, for example, is one of the projects that I'm doing that um, is has to do with re- representing that part of me, like the, you know, the, the cultural Brazilian musical part. And, um, yeah, this trip coming up to Brazil now is interesting because... Um, it's yeah I'm excited for it because I'll be able to train and really like integrate those those skills and that knowledge and that part of me that I have to offer in this musical landscape yeah wicked Mm. wicked (laughs) um so yeah just before we went on that that trip yeah (laughs) yeah you were talking about um the parallel paths Mm. Like, oh yeah, so my then and I in yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she also grew up with the capoeira and with the music and stuff and she then dabbled in, you know, she studied uh set design at NIDA. Mm-hmm. And then a few years ago, like 3 4 years ago in the last few years or whatever, we both um found ourselves in similar musical circles. So she um you know, she was singing a lot and I was, you know, doing what I was doing in the music and everything and we our friends um, started into interrelating and so we um you know we met up again and we were like yo like hey again um mm. and uh yeah I remember when she had her um album pre-listening event like at 505 at some point I remember going and being like wow like this is that girl that I knew that I grew up with and she's done this you know she's doing this amazing thing now and that's so cool and you know, I remember even taking a photo and I put up a thing being like, oh, like, you know, my, you know, like so proud of you, like the girl that I grew up with and you're doing all these awesome things. But even at that point, we weren't doing, you know, we weren't doing anything together. And that very event, uh, it's a uh, Funk the Bass series of events that my friend Iresh puts on. That's where Maite had her album listening party. She, Iresh put an event on for Sydney Fringe Festival last year where she had a lineup of women um, doing acts in languages other than English so she had a lineup of awesome, awesome women doing it. And she asked me and Maite there because we were both, you know, I was singing and playing, you know, with my dad in the band at the time. And Maite was also, you know, doing her Brazilian music with her stuff as well. She was like, can, Eresh was like, you know, can you do something together? And we were like, yes, like great idea. <laughs> so we got together and um, we were like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, we've got two months to prepare this set. Like, let's, you know, like we got excited and we were like, let's do it like properly. So we started with research. We were like, how can we present Brazilian music, you know, the Brazilian music that we grew up with and that we know and everything, how can we present this? And I remember at the beginning I was like, oh, like, you know, like we'll do a little bit of a set across the ages. Like we'll do a bossa nova song, we'll do a samba song, we'll do a traditional song because we were she was one of the girls we were the, she was one of the ones that was training the bata with dom mm-hmm. so at the same time like me and you know we had been integrating this knowledge that we had grown up with with our parents with dom so anyway we got into the research of it and researching the cultural origins of brazilian music and that's where odoya came from so we started developing um this set and i still 
wasn't that well at the time. I was still like physically, you know, like I was super functioning in the world, like an mm-hmm. already junk out beats doing all these projects, but like my whole body was aching. Like I'd get home and like be sick because I was super stressed out and stuff. And so, you know, bless her cotton socks, my there kind of can edit that out, right? No, I won't. It's, it's cool. <laughs> so we'll wrap that up quickly. So we'll wrap that, <laughs> so we'll wrap that up. So anyway, so Maite's background in set design meant that at the beginning, you know, we were putting this show together and she, I remember being like, what's going on? Like we were doing this thing and all of a sudden we had this theatrical piece with storytelling, um, the music, the rhythms, the songs, the dances. And so we ended up with kind of like a triptych, trip t- I think that's how you say it, um, of we started with like one set that was like a traditional, the Yemaya, the really traditional spiritual drumming thing. The next one that we did was Makulele, which is the story of a boy who goes and fights with his sticks and there's a whole like stick dance and the rhythm is that um cha cha dum dum cha dum cha cha dum dum cha comes from Makulele, has the whole story, the mute, the songs and the dances. Mm. And then we did a capoeira set at the end with a capoeira song and we do a little bit of capoeira, tell the stories, sing the songs and stuff. And so that was like version 0.1 of the Odoya show that we ended up with for the Funk the Bass Night at 5.05. Right. And from that night, from that show, like the Odoya thing just obviously then took off and we've ended up now, um, you know, going in the studio with Oyobi, which, uh, you know, the three uh, guys, uh, Vincent Sebastian out of Ventura and Daniel Pliner, We've gotten in the studio with them, doing, you know, some tracks with them, integrating all that stuff. And so, yeah, although, yeah, really, um, really rolled off. And it's an amazing, yeah, it's an awesome project. Started by Iresh, Irena Stella on the socials, who, um, you know, bless her cotton socks because she is just a real-life angel. And she, like you, is just one of those people who, She's just always been about providing platforms and spaces for people, for the community, for the music and arts community to grow. And she's started off so many projects. And so, you know, it's thanks to her, you know, that that was able to flourish and come into existence. And, you know, she even recently put on The Last Funk, The Bass was Oyobi Mm -hmm. and Although Yeah Special, where we did, um, you know, a little combo, uh, which was really awesome. And, yeah, it's exciting working with those boys and it's kind of Mm. just, you know, like... A little match made in heaven. Mm. Uh, so that's really exciting. Yeah. That's really cool. So we just got the hurry up from the library. So Library is now closing. We library have is now minutes. closing. <laughs> now, so you're going away next week. How long are you going away for? Yeah, two months. So it's two, two weeks first in Colombia because my grandma decided to have her 80th birthday in Colombia awesome. with all the family, which is definitely awesome. Mm. Um, and then off to Brazil to Salvador, Bahia, the north the Afro-Brazilian cultural capital of Brazil to do this dance course, um, which I've been wanting to do for years, um, and to go deep into the percussion training uh, and learning. I want to learn, you know, the traditional songs and a lot of that stuff as well. And just finally going back there with the intention to, uh, you know, and I've got a bunch of friends as well who have hooked me up with like awesome people to go and you know, do some stuff with. So, yeah, that's that trip. So I'm really excited for that. That's in a week and going to be a month and a half in Brazil. Come awesome. back in September with all that goodness to share over here. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I think when you get back we should sit down and talk about that. Yeah, 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 be yeah, cool. yeah. definitely. Because I feel like we've been rushed now. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got to wrap it up. But definitely we'll have up. a lot to lot to talk about at the yeah. end of that trip. All right. Well, how about we call this um, – um, Marina De Silva, part one. Part one, yeah, part chapter one. one. Chapter one. <laughs> Enjoy your trip. And, um, Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks for uh, chatting with me today. That was awesome. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having me on. Sweet it was ass. a pleasure. Awesome. All right, catch you later. Thank you. See ya. Dance. Music. Music. Hola, ela, ela. 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 Hola, ela, ela.
Aprenderam o que é o berimbau. E aí, Marina? O que, é que é capoeira? Capoeira é defesa, tá? É ginga de corpo, é malandro. Isso aí, capoeira! É defesa, tá? É ginga de corpo, é malandro. É capoeira é defesa, tá? É ginga de corpo, é malandro. Aí, olha aí, já aprendeu até o que é capoeira. Mas, papai, você sabe o que é capoeira? Sim, vou falar agora então. Capoeira é tudo que o homem come e digere. Capoeira é a luta do homem escravo, oprimido pela miséria e racismo. Capoeira é o direito a ter casa própria, comida, escola e igualdade de direitos sociais. Capoeira é a liberdade, cultura, respeito ao próximo e luta contra a fome e a inflação. E o resto de capoeira é Bruce Lee que inventaram pelo mundo afora, papai? Ux, ux, ok. Capoeira de verdade existe para ajudar o homem a evoluir o espírito, minha filha, e lutar contra o governo feitor de escravo. A gente tem que reciclar todo esse excesso de violência na capoeira antes da chegada do ano 2000. E yeah, aí, camarada! É isso aí, filha. Vamos unificar nossos quilombos e evoluir com a capoeira para acabar com essa miséria espiritual e violência que se abateu sobre nós. Os capoeiristas... Não, filha, todo mundo. Capoeira é a luta do homem pela sobrevivência. Capoeira é a vida. Axé, capoeira! É, então vamos lá, vamos lá, Marina. Vamos fazer um joguinho de capoeira. É isso aí, vamos lá jogar um jogo de Angola. Eita, vamos lá. 